Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you all here to the John F. Kennedy Space Center. From 1969 to 1972, this country regularly sent men to the moon. And today we are very pleased and privileged to have with us one of the men who made those epic voyages during the Apollo program. He is from Jackson, Michigan. He holds engineering degrees from the, United, from the University of Michigan and from the United States uh, Military Academy at West Point. He also attended the Empire Test Pilot School in Farnborough, England, and went on to serve as an instructor pilot at the Advanced Aerospace Research Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. All told, during his career as a single-seat fighter pilot and test pilot, he's rolled up some 4,000 hours of flight time in several types of aircraft. He was selected by NASA as an astronaut in 1966. He served on the support crew for Apollo 9, the backup crew for Apollo 12, and he flew as a command module pilot on board Apollo 15. Now on that flight, while Dave Scott and Jim Irwin walked on the surface of the moon, our guests orbited the moon 75 times, performing the first comprehensive scientific and photographic survey of the moon from lunar orbit. And on top of all that, on the way back home, he performed the world's first deep space space walk. And he's with us today to share his remarkable perspective on all this history. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome astronaut Al Wood. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Welcome to, uh, I won't say I'm prejudiced about this place, <laughs> but this is the most unique, most fantastic place in this country. This is where every single human being has been launched from this country into space. Every single one. It's a little quiet around here today because things aren't going the way we would like to see it, but then again, I'm prejudiced. Takes a lot of guts and a lot of national courage and drive and resources and intelligence and all kinds of things to put on a space program in the world today. This all got started back in the early 60s when John Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon in 10 years and bring the guys back. We like that part. Bring them back. That's good. Um, back in those days, there's a lot of political stuff going on and that's kind of why how we got into uh, going to the moon instead of doing something else. But I have to say, and I, and I want to diverge just a little bit from just talking about Kennedy and the space program. I, 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 I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the real value of the space program. And it's not going to the moon. Yeah, we can put guys on the moon. That's, that's just a, a, an accomplishment that requires a lot of technological know-how. Now let me tell you, we were able to do that back in the 70s because of the technology that was developed in this country in the late 50s. Some of you, maybe a lot of you, remember the days when radios had vacuum tubes. Well, this country developed a thing called solid state circuitry. That silicon chips, the Defense Advanced Research Products Agency, funded the research that ended up producing silicon chips. That reduced all electronic circuitry to a very, very small package. And it became solid state. Now, that not only allowed us, I, I've been to Russia. I've seen their spacecraft. I've seen the equipment they have in their spacecraft. I was there in the mid 90s, okay? They were still using vacuum tubes. <laughs> 20 years before that, we went to the moon using solid state. We had a computer that was hand-wired. You couldn't hurt it. You could drop it. You could burn it. You could fry it. You could do anything. Put power back on, and that computer was right back up running again. Computer designed by MIT, built by a company out in Wisconsin. And it had all the programs we needed to go to the moon and come back. And it had a total programmable memory of 75 K. <laughs> 75,000 bits. Now, this watch that I've got on probably has more than that. That's how far we have come. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the real benefit from the space program is the technology that was developed. And that technology filtered down into commercial manufacturing in this country. And it resulted in a plethora of things that we use today. 
cell phones, I, 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 have, a, I have an iPad. Okay? That iPad is one of the most wonderful things I've ever seen. How about solid state? How about flat panel displays? How about MRI machines? How about CT scans? How about, how about, how about, I, I could go on forever. That is technology that was derived from stuff that we needed for the space program. And the government funded that research to get that stuff. We don't have that anymore. That's gone, unfortunately. So I don't know what that does to the space program, but I just want to get my little pitch in about technology. <laughs> I think so quick. Now, we'll have some fun. <laughs> Let's talk about the cape. The cape has been here since the 50s. There's over 100,000 acres here, and most of it is in wildlife management, believe it or not. There's all kinds of wildlife here. Now, a very small strip over by the ocean was developed for launch pads. So you can see the row of launch pads, and off in the distance there, you see the, those two buildings in the, in the upper middle, those are both Air Force, and then clear in the background is the VAB. A lot of land went into building launch pads in close to the ocean. Obviously close to the ocean because if we lose one during launch, it goes in the ocean, it doesn't hurt anybody. The rest of the land here is in wildlife, and there are all kinds of wildlife here. There's alligators, there's snakes, there's eagles, <laughs> alligators. Would you believe it if I told you, if any of you are golfers, this is a five iron shot from where we're sitting right now, where these alligators are, the little pond back here. Last census, there are something like 5,000 alligators that live here. And they're not molested. They don't have, there's no natural predator for alligators. They caught one here a couple of years ago that was like over 20 feet long. I saw a picture of it on the back of a pickup truck with a, with, with a big crane on the back, picked up, and it went from the crane all the way down to the ground and around. It's like over 20 feet long. There's one across the river here, where the museum is, the Astronaut Museum. There's one in the river there that they figure is like 18 feet long. So they grow, they grow pretty big, really long. <laughs> Snakes. I have often thought, and I am so glad, I was not one of the guys digging trenches here uh, to build the log <laughs> pads. Because the first thing they had to deal with were the snakes. And there are some big snakes here, let me tell you. Eagles. When I first started working here, and if you take the cluster out to the Cape or out to the Saturn Five, I guess there's still time for that in there. Okay, go out to the Saturn Five. On the way out, the bus driver will point out the eagle's nest. That's the original eagle's nest. That was there when I first started working here in the 60s. There, were, there was a pair of them then. And in fact, there's a video camera that watches them day and night. Well, today, I understand there's like 30 pairs of eagles that live here now, making, making this their home. Well, you can understand there's lots and lots of food running around on the ground floor because it's all wildlife managed area. So that's kind of the wildlife side of this. Uh, on, on, the, on the space side of things, um, we got lots and lots of launch pads. We, we launched off of Pad 37, uh, one of the 37s. Uh, the original Apollos went off of um, uh, 34. Uh, we flew on a Saturn V. If you go to the Saturn V Center, you'll see one of those stretched out. Largest object that's ever been launched from the surface of the Earth, and we were able to do that 40 years ago. Can't do it today. 40 years ago, we could launch this. This thing is 360 feet long. 30 feet diameter at the base. Five engines at the base in the first stage that put out seven and a half million pounds of thrust. You can hear this thing 100 miles away when it launches. Mm -hmm. The ground shakes. Three state vehicle, um, seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and we launched at about seven million pounds. About double the weight of the shuttle when it goes. So we were very, in fact, we were the heaviest uh, launch vehicle in the program. Um, a little history, crew. The crew was Dave Scott on the left here. Dave was the commander. He had flown on Gemini 8 with Neil Armstrong and on Apollo 9 with Jim McDivitt. And he became the commander of our crew. And we were the backup crew on Apollo 12 where we got all of our basic training on how to fly the machine for a year and a half. And then we were assigned as a prime crew on 15 that gave us a year and a half 
to learn all the science that we're going to do once we got to the moon. So that was a very, very intense, all-consuming three years getting ready to go. And you can imagine what a guy would feel like if he got up to launch day and the doctor said, gee, i got to have to disqualify you from flight today because you did something wrong with you. And that actually happened on Apollo 13. One of the guys was suspected of having German visas and they took him off. Um, unfortunate, but that's the way it, that's what it goes. Ken Mattingly ended, was the guy, and he ended up flying on Apollo 16. Actually, he was lucky. Apollo 13 never made it. They had a little explosion on the way. They had to come back home. Apollo 16 actually went to the moon, and they landed, and so he got the full shot. The suits we have on are full-pressure suits. You cannot survive in a vacuum unless you've got pressure on the body. So these suits were designed and built for us. Uh, to maintain a pressure on us while we're out there. Uh, they're made by International Latex Corporation in Dover, Delaware, made up of some 26, 27 different layers of material, all sewn together by hand. Uh, very, very labor-intensive operation. We went to Dover, Delaware a number of times to get fitted. We were all fitted individually. Well, they were tailored for us. We each got two suits. They were worth a quarter of a million dollars each. A lot of money. We didn't care. <laughs> but that's okay with me. So save my life. I don't care how much it costs. Um, they weigh about 85 pounds. So here on Earth, they are absolute pain. They are very difficult, especially if you're out here. We launched in July. We're out here training out on the outside in June and July at 100 degrees with one of these 85 pound suits on. I'm telling you, and there is no heat transfer in those suits. So whatever heat you generate inside stays with you. So they're, they're tough out here. You get in space, you don't even know you got a suit on. Because what you do is you float inside the suit. Hmm. So there's no weight, no nothing. They're, 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 they're easy once you get there. The crew was allowed to do two things. We could name our spacecraft and we could pick our own crew patch, like you see here. To name the spacecraft, the lunar module was easy. All three of us were Air Force guys. So we named it the Falcon, which is the Air Force Academy's mascot. <laughs> we named the command module the Endeavor after Sir Francis Scott's sailing ship Endeavor back in the 1700s that he used to go to the South Pacific on a scientific expedition. We considered we were on a scientific expedition, so the name was perfect for us. The crew patch we couldn't figure out. We didn't know what to do, so we asked a friend of a friend to help us. The friend of a friend was a guy by the name of Emilio Pucci. He is an Italian dress designer. And he does some crazy, crazy things. Uh, he, he uses all pastel colors. It's all swirly and, you know, the violets and the blues and the purples and all that. And I was kind of concerned that we were asking him to help us with this thing. <laughs> but I found out that he graduated from Georgia Tech. He's an engineer from Georgia Tech. He flew in the Italian Air Force during World War II as a fighter pilot after the war. He did what all Italian fighter pilots really wanted to do. He got into the ladies' clothes. <laughs> and very successful at that. Anyway, he helped us design the screw patch. And I still think it's the best, it's the best representation of what we did and what it was all about with the three birds flying over the lunar surface. Now we were told we couldn't use Roman numerals on our patch. We didn't like that. We had to use numbers. We didn't like that, so we arranged the craters behind the two, the three birds. Uh, and if you look closely, you'll see the shadow patterns of those craters. And they form an X and a B, which is Roman number 15. Oh. It's kind of interesting. The sun would have to be shining from both directions for that. <laughs> but we did it. We sent it up to Washington thinking they're going to find out. They're going to, they're going to see that. It's so obvious. Nah, nobody picked up on it. So we were able to use it on our, on our group. And it's on my patch here, too. Uh, so anyway, that gets us started. Uh, morning of launch, we got up early in the morning. Uh, went down to see the flight surgeon, got our final check. Went down to the next room. They had a barber at 5.30 in the morning. Oh, wow. Government program. Uh, <laughs> we got a haircut. And, I, and I've often wondered 
what spark can I figure out <laughs> who we might see out there that we needed a haircut? Because <laughs> otherwise, who cares? You know? So anyway, we got a haircut. Then we went down to our dining room and had our last breakfast, which in the vernacular of the day was called a low residual breakfast. I'll let you figure that out. And then we went down to the suit room, put on our suits, and we started pretty reading through Austin because we didn't want to get bends if we lost pressure on the way to work. So we breathe pure oxygen, and that washes out the nitrogen in your bloodstream, and if you have a change in pressure on your body, then you don't get the bits. So that's what we did. Here we are, resting in the crew suit room. At the right time, we grabbed our little portable oxygen pack, and we went down the hall, down the elevator, got in the van to drive out to the launch pad, which was seven miles away. A million people there to watch our launch. Um, and we went through that, and we decided we would not come back through that throng if we couldn't launch that day. We'd find another way back. Anyway, we got up to the launch pad, got in the elevator, went up to the top of the launch platform, walked over into the elevator, and then went up to the 35th floor, because that's where the spacecraft is. So the 35th floor from the launch, from the top of the launch platform to the spacecraft is 35th floor, 350 feet. And the top of the launch platform is about 150 feet above the ground. So we're like 500 feet above the ground. We walk across this catwalk, and if you look at the catwalk carefully, you'll see that this brown, the bottom of it is brown, and covered with a canvas. That's pure steel planking, basically, shredded steel that you can see through. I asked the ground crew one time, why is that? They said, well, some of the early guys coming out here to do some tests got halfway out, they looked down through their feet, they could see the ground, and that was as far as they got. They grabbed the handrails and they wouldn't move. So we had to go out and help them out the rest of the way. So they covered a lot of it so we couldn't see that. We got in the spacecraft. Um, the pad leader is the guy with the yellow hat. A guy by the name of Gunther Bent. Gunther was a fixture here. He was a famous icon. He is a German. He was in the Luftwaffe during World War II at the end of the war. Uh, I don't think he ever hurt anybody. I, he plays games, but he didn't hurt anybody. He was the pad leader for every flight up through the shuttle program. Hmm. Every single flight, he was the guy. Hmm. And I will never forget, we started to get into spacecraft, and I hesitated for some reason or other. I, 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 it wasn't over anything. And Gunther picked up a crescent wrench, it was about yay long, about that wide across the end, and he said, you better get in now. <laughs> yeah, but that's the way he was, and a great guy. We got in, they closed the hatch, put the heat shield on, they broke down the clean room, they got in the elevator, went down to the ground, got in their car, and they drove three and a half miles away. Why? Because it's dangerous to be within three and a half miles of this thing during launch. If that thing should explode, you're talking, oh, you're talking six and a half million pounds of very highly explosive fuel. That's a, that's a big bomb. So you can't be within three and a half miles. And of course, we were right in the middle of it, thinking about it for a couple of hours. Uh, but uh, we decided what's going to happen is going to happen, and nothing did. So we were fine. As a matter of fact, Jim and I went to sleep for a while, uh, waiting for the clock to come. And uh, left Dave up to talk on the radio. At 9.34 in the morning, everything lit off, and off we went. We lifted off very slowly. As a matter of fact, we lifted off so slow, we didn't know we were off the path. It took the Launch Control Center to tell us that we were on our way, that we, had, we were going. Uh, very slow, very slow coming off. As we burn out fuel, the thrust level stayed the same, but, the, but our weight went down as we burned fuel. That meant we went faster and faster and faster. And at the end of the first stage burnout, we were about 50,000 feet, 50 miles downrange, about 5,000 miles an hour. And we had burned up about 6 million pounds worth of fuel at that point. Took a lot to get us going. Second stage took us up to 80 miles, about 12,000 miles an hour, and the third stage put us into orbit at 90 miles. We went around the Earth one and a half times over Hawaii. We fired off the third stage engine again, the S4B engine, which you see here, and we added another 8,000 miles to our velocity. So we were at that point 25,000 miles an hour, or well, actually almost 26,000 miles an hour. Seems like you're really going fast. 26,000 miles an hour. The problem is, out there, there isn't anything going by the window. You don't know. There's nothing to relate your speed to, except what you see on a computer, and it doesn't mean anything. 
Um, as we're going towards the moon, we unlocked from the S4B, went out, turned around, and uh, inside the shroud at the end of the S4B was the lunar module. We docked with the lunar module, made an electrical connection, hit a switch, blew some uh, explosive bolts, released the lunar module, and now we're going to the moon, as you see here, with the lunar module stuck on the front. There's a tunnel between the two. We can take out a pressure hatch on either side, opening up a tunnel that we can go through whenever. We left it open most of the time. Um, that's the way we went to the moon. Now, there's a problem going to the moon with heat. Once you get out of the atmosphere, the sun's energy is fierce, let me tell you. Really fierce. If we had stayed in one attitude and the sun were shining on us on one side all the time, the temperature on the outside of the spacecraft would go up to about 350, they figured. And on the shadowed side, on the other side, is about minus 250. So that's a 600 degree temperature differential across the spacecraft. And uh, we were concerned about heating and uh, expansion and contraction and that kind of thing. So what we did is we turned the whole thing perpendicular to the plane that holds the Earth and the Sun and the Moon, called the plane of the ecliptic, and we slowly rotated all the way to the Moon so we get even heating around the outside. It worked very well. Of course, that was called the barbecue maneuver. That's the way everybody related to it. It took us three and a half days to get to the moon. We went into the moon backwards because what we had to do when we got to the back side of the moon was slow down. The only way we can do that is to fire the engine in the direction we're going so that the thrust is back along our track to slow us down. So here you see us going in. We're coming from right to left around the moon here. And you can see the engine is in front of us. We slowed down about 3,000 miles an hour and uh, we went into an orbit that was 60 miles high above the moon. Um, the next day, Dave and Jim, we all put on our pressure suits at that point. Dave and Jim got the lunar module, we closed all the hatches, they undocked and they went down and landed on the moon. And I stayed in lunar orbit by myself. They went down to an area called, oh, here's, here's what I lived in. The cone shape at the top there is the command module. Command module, was the Cadillac of the space program back in those days. 200 and, about 212 cubic feet of volume inside this thing. Now, I have to tell you, Mercury program was 45 cubic feet for one guy. The Gemini program was 75 cubic feet, if I recall. For two guys, that's 37 and a half apiece. We had like 220 or 215, 220, something like that for the three of us. It's about 70 cubic feet per person. That's not very much. We were very close. And we had to learn how to live with each other. And that was maybe a big thing that we learned on the flight, was just how to live with each other when you're that close and you're going to be there for so long. Because what you have to do is you got to sleep, you got to eat, you got to drink, you got to poop. <laughs> whatever you want to call it. I mean, I'm being very honest with you, uh, but there are things you have to do, and we had to learn how to do that with the two other guys watching you all the time. It's not much fun. <laughs> but we're explorers, so we're going to do that. We didn't care. We, you know, we, we got along with that, okay. Um, while I was in orbit, I had this scientific instrument module. In it, I had a very large camera that was a high-resolution camera. It was the camera that was designed in the 50s for the U2 program. They declared it obsolete, so we were able to carry it on our flight. It would take pictures from 60 miles. It would take pictures of objects very clearly down to four feet. Phenomenal, unbelievable camera. But it was a film camera, not a digital camera. Now that YouTube's and everybody's using digital stuff. But this was an old film camera. Absolutely fantastic camera. The other camera we carried was a mapping camera, and it took individual pictures as we went along over the surface of the moon. It had a laser altimeter that indicated the altitude at the center of the picture of each of the frames. And we carried a, a suite of remote sensors that we used to scan the surface of the moon and all kinds of other things while we were there. So we had a pretty complete uh, scientific laboratory in, in the moon. I, I photographed about 25% of the moon's surface over there. Uh, never been done before. Dave and Jim landed in an area called Hadley Grill. Hadley Grill is, we think, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with lava tubes or not, but if you go to Oregon, you'll see lots and lots of lava tubes. What happens is molten lava comes down the hill, 
and, and, and it forms kind of a stream, and the top surface will cool off and solidify, and then the molten lava runs out underneath it, leaving a tunnel that goes right up the side of the mountain. You see lots of these in Oregon. You see tons of them in Hawaii. Lots of them. We think this is a, a, a collapsed lava tube. That's what the latest was. Here on Earth, a lava tube would be 30 feet in diameter. This one on the moon is 1,000 feet across and 700 feet deep. And we think that's due to the difference in gravity between the Earth and the moon. Dave and Jim got out their little lunar rover. You can see it on the right hand side here. That's Jim saluting the flag. The lunar module in the background. The top silver part is the ascent stage. That's the only thing that comes off the surface. And the bottom gold part is the descent stage that they used had the fuel and the engine to get them down on the surface. They spent three days there, about eight hours a day, well, anywhere from six to eight hours a day, driving the little lunar rover around and collecting rocks. You know what, you know what, you know what lunar guys from data on the moon, you know what their primary job is? Picking up rocks. Picking up 